Chapter 43. Jason. When Jason's lance broke, he knew he was dead. The battle had started well enough. Jason's instincts kicked in and his gut told him he'd dueled opponents almost this big before. Size and strength equaled slowness. So Jason just had to be quicker, pace himself, wear out his opponent and avoid getting smashed or flame broiled. He rolled away from the giant's first spear thrust and jabbed Enceladus in the ankle. Jason's javelin managed to pierce the thick dragon hide and golden ichor, the blood of immortals, trickled down the giant's clawed foot. Enceladus bellowed in pain and blasted him with fire. Jason scrambled away, rolling behind the giant and struck again behind his knee. It went on like that for seconds, minutes. It was hard to judge. Jason heard combat across the clearing, construction equipment grinding, fire roaring, monsters shouting and rocks smashing into metal. He heard Leo and Piper yelling defiantly, which meant they were still alive. Jason tried not to think about it. He couldn't afford to get distracted. Enceladus's spear missed him by a hair's breadth. Jason kept dodging, but the ground stuck to his feet. Gaia was getting stronger and the giant was getting faster. Enceladus might be slow, but he wasn't dumb. He began anticipating Jason's moves, and Jason's attacks were only annoying him, making him more enraged. I'm not some minor monster, Enceladus bellowed. I am a giant born to destroy gods. Your little gold toothpick can't kill me, boy. Jason didn't waste energy replying. He was already tired. The ground clung to his feet, making him feel like he weighed an extra hundred pounds. The air was full of smoke that burned his lungs. Fires roared around him, stoked by the winds, and the temperature was approaching the heat of an oven. Jason raised his javelin to block the giant's next strike. A big mistake. Don't fight force with force, a voice chided him. The wolf, Looper, who told him that long ago. He'd managed to deflect the spear, but it grazed his shoulder and his arm went numb. He backed up, almost tripping over a burning log. He had to delay, to keep the giant's attention fixed on him, while his friends dealt with the earthborn and rescued Piper's dad. He couldn't fail. He retreated, trying to lure the giant to the edge of the clearing. Enceladus could sense his weariness. The giant smiled, baring his fangs. The mighty Jason Grace, he taunted. Yes, we know about you, son of Jupiter, the one who led the assault on Mount Orphus, the one who single-handedly slew the Titan Krios and toppled the Black Throne. Jason's mind reeled. He didn't know these names, yet they made his skin tingle, as if his body remembered the pain his mind didn't. What are you talking about? he asked. He realised his mistake when Enceladus breathed fire. Distracted, Jason moved too, too slowly. The blast missed him, but heat blistered his back. He slammed into the ground, his clothes smouldering. He was blinded by ash and smoke, choking as he tried to breathe. He scrambled back as the giant spear cleaved the ground between his feet. Jason managed to stand. If he could only summon one good blast of lightning. But he was already drained, and in this condition the effort might kill him. He didn't even know if electricity would harm the giant. Death in battle is honourable, said Looper's voice. That's real comforting, Jason thought. One last try. Jason took a deep breath and charged. Enceladus let him approach, grinning with anticipation. At the last second, Jason faked a strike and rolled between the giant's legs. He came up quickly, thrusting with all his might, ready to stab the giant in the small of his back. But Enceladus anticipated the trick. He stepped aside with too much speed and agility for a giant, as if the earth were helping him move. He swept his spear sideways, met Jason's javelin, and, with a snap like a shotgun blast, the golden weapon shattered. The explosion was hotter than the giant's breath, blinding Jason with golden light. The force knocked him off his feet and squeezed the breath out of him. When he regained his focus, he was sitting at the rim of a crater. Enceladus stood at the other side, staggering and confused. The javelin's destruction had released so much energy it had blasted a perfect cone-shaped pit, thirty feet deep, fusing the dirt and rock into a slick, glassy substance. Jason wasn't sure how he'd survived, but his clothes were steaming. He was out of energy, he had no weapon, and Enceladus was still very much alive. Jason tried to get up, but his legs were like lead. Enceladus blinked at the destruction and then laughed. Impressive! Unfortunately, that was your last trick, demigod. Enceladus leapt the crater in a single bound, planting his feet on either side of Jason. The giant raised his spear, its tip hovering six feet over Jason's chest. And now... Enceladus said, my first sacrifice to Gaia. Chapter 44. Jason. Time seemed to slow down, which was really frustrating since Jason still couldn't move. He felt himself sinking into the earth like the ground was a waterbed, comfortable, urging him to relax and give up. 
He wondered if the stories of the underworld were true. Would he end up in the fields of punishment or Elysium? If he couldn't remember any of his deeds, would they still count? He wondered if the judges would take that into consideration, or if his dad, Zeus, would write him a note. Please excuse Jason from eternal damnation. He's had amnesia. Jason couldn't feel his arms. He could see the tip of the spear coming towards his chest in slow motion. He knew he should move, but he couldn't seem to do it. Funny, he thought, all that effort to stay alive and then boom, you just lie there helplessly while a fire-breathing giant impales you. Leo's voice yelled, heads up! A large black metal wedge slammed into Enceladus with a massive funk. The giant toppled over and slid into the pit. Jason, get up, Piper called. Her voice energised him, shook him out of his stupor. He sat up, his head groggy, while Piper grabbed him under his arms and hauled him to his feet. Don't die on me, she ordered. You are not dying on me. Yes, ma'am. He felt light-headed, but she was about the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. Her hair was smouldering, her face was smudged with soot. She had a cut on her arm, her dress was torn, and she was missing a boot. Beautiful. About a hundred feet behind her, Leo was standing over a piece of construction equipment, a long cannon-like thing with a single massive piston, the edge broken clean off. Then Jason looked down in the crater and saw where the other end of the hydraulic axe had gone. Enceladus was struggling to rise, an axe blade the size of a washing machine stuck in his breastplate. Amazingly, the giant managed to pull the axe blade free. He yelled in pain and the mountain trembled. Golden ichor soaked the front of his armour, but Enceladus stood. Shakily, he bent down and retrieved his spear. Good try, the giant winced, but I cannot be beaten. As they watched, the giant's armour mended itself and the ichor stopped flowing. Even the cuts on his dragon scale legs, which Jason had worked so hard to make, were now just pale scars. Leo ran up to them, saw the giant and cursed. What is it with this guy? Die already! My fate is preordained, Enceladus said. Giants cannot be killed by gods or heroes. Only by both, Jason said. The giant's smile faltered, and Jason saw in his eyes something like fear. It's true, isn't it? Gods and demigods have to work together to kill you. You will not live long enough to try. The giant started stumbling up the crater's slope, slipping on the grassy sides. Anyone have a good god handy? Leo asked. Jason's heart filled with dread. He looked at the giant below them, struggling to get out of the pit, and he knew what had to happen. Leo, he said, if you've got a rope in that tool belt, get it ready. He leapt at the giant with no weapon but his bare hands. Enceladus, Piper yelled, look behind you. It was an obvious trick, but her voice was so compelling, even Jason bought it. The giant said, what? And turned a light around, like there was an enormous spider on his back. Jason tackled his legs at just the right moment. The giant lost his balance. Encelada slammed into the crater and slid to the bottom. While he tried to rise, Jason put his arms around the giant's neck. When Encelada struggled to his feet, Jason was riding his shoulders. Get off! Encelada screamed. He tried to grab Jason's legs, but Jason scrabbled around, squirming and climbing over the giant's hair. Father, Jason thought, if I've ever done anything good, anything you approved of, help me now. I offer my own life. Just save my friends. Suddenly he could smell the metallic scent of a storm. Darkness swallowed the sun. The giant froze, sensing it too. Jason yelled to his friends, hit the deck, and every hair on his head stood straight up. Crack! Lightning surged through Jason's body, straight through Enceladus and into the ground. The giant's back stiffened and Jason was thrown clear. When he regained his bearings, he was slipping down the side of the crater, and the crater was cracking open. The lightning bolt had split the mountain itself. The earth rumbled and tore apart, and Enceladus' legs slid into the chasm. He clawed helplessly as the glassy sides of the pit, and just for a moment managed to hold on to the edge, his hands trembling. He fixed Jason with a look of hatred. You've won nothing, boy. My brothers are rising, and they are ten times as strong as I. We will destroy the gods at their roots. You will die, and Olympus will die with... The giant lost his grip and fell into the crevice. The earth shook. Jason fell towards the rift. Grab hold, Leo yelled. Jason's feet were at the edge of the chasm when he grabbed the rope and Leo and Piper pulled him up. They stood together exhausted and terrified as the chasm closed like an angry mouth. The ground stopped pulling at their feet. For now, Gaia was gone. The mountainside was afire, all on fire. Smoke billowed hundreds of feet into the air. Jason spotted a helicopter, maybe firefighters or reporters coming towards them. All around them was carnage. The earthborn had melted into piles of clay, leaving behind only their rock missiles and some nasty bits of loincloth. 
but Jason figured they would reform soon enough. Construction equipment lay in ruins. The ground was scarred and blackened. Coach Hedge started to move. He sat up with a groan and rubbed his head. His canary yellow trousers were now the colour of Dijon mustard mixed with mud. He blinked and looked around him at the battle scene. Did I do this? Before Jason could reply, Hedge picked up his club and got shakily to his feet. Yeah, you wanted some hoof? I gave you hoof, cupcakes. Who's the goat, huh? He did a little dance, kicking rocks and making what were probably rude satyr gestures at the piles of clay. Leo cracked a smile and Jason couldn't help it. He started to laugh. It probably sounded a little hysterical, but it was such a relief to be alive he didn't care. Then a man stood up across the clearing. Tristan McLean staggered forward. His eyes were hollow, shell-shocked like someone who just walked through a nuclear wasteland. Piper, he called. His voice cracked. Pipes, what, what is this? He couldn't complete the thought. Piper ran over to him and hugged him tightly, but he almost didn't seem to know her. Jason had felt a similar way that morning at the Grand Canyon when he woke with no memory. But Mr. McLean had the opposite problem. He had too many memories, too much trauma his mind just couldn't handle. He was coming apart. We need to get him out of here, Jason said. Yeah, but how, Leo said. He's in no shape to walk. Jason glanced up at the helicopter, which was now circling directly overhead. Can you make us a bullhorn or something? He asked Leo. Piper has some talking to do. Chapter 45. Piper. Borrowing the helicopter was easy. Getting her dad on board was not. Piper needed only a few words through Leo's improvised bullhorn to convince the pilot to land on the mountain. The park service copter was big enough for medical evacuations or search and rescue. And when Piper told the very nice ranger polite la pilot lady that it would be a great idea to fly them to the Oakland airport, she readily agreed. No, her dad muttered as they picked him up off the ground. Piper, what? There were monsters. There were monsters. She needed both Leo's and Jason's help to hold him, while Coach Hedge gathered their supplies. Fortunately, Hedge had put his trousers and shoes back on, so Piper didn't have to explain the goat legs. It broke Piper's heart to see her dad like this pushed beyond the breaking point, crying like a little boy. She didn't know what the giant had done to him exactly, how the monsters had shattered his spirit, but she didn't think she could stand to find out. It'll be okay, Dad, she said, making her voice as soothing as possible. She didn't want to charm speak her own father, but it seemed the only way. These people are my friends. We're going to help you. You're safe now. He blinked and looked up at helicopter rotors. Blades. They had a machine with so many blades. They had six arms. When they got him to the bay doors, the pilot came over to help. What's wrong with him? She asked. Uh, a smoke inhalation, Jason suggested, or heat exhaustion. We should get him to hospital, the pilot said. It's okay, Piper said. The airport is good. Yeah, the airport is good, the pilot agreed immediately. And then she frowned as if uncertain why she'd changed her mind. Isn't he Tristan McLean, the movie star? No, Piper said. He only looks like him. Forget it. Yeah, the pilot said. Only looks like him. I, uh, she blinked, confused. I forgot what I was saying. Uh, let's get going. Jason raised his eyebrows at Piper, obviously impressed, but Piper felt miserable. She didn't want to twist people's minds, convince them of things they didn't believe. It felt so bossy, so wrong, like something Drew would do back at camp, or Medea in her evil department store. And how would it help her father? She couldn't convince him he would be okay, or that nothing had happened. His trauma was just too deep. Finally, they got him on board and the helicopter took off. The pilot kept getting questions over her radio, asking her where she was going, but she ignored them. They veered away from the burning mountain and headed towards the Berkeley Hills. Piper. Her dad grasped her hand and held on like he was afraid he'd fall. It's you. They told me. They told me you would die. They said horrible things would happen. It's me, dad. It took all her willpower not to cry. She had to be strong for him. Everything's going to be okay. They were monsters, he said. Real monsters, earth spirits, right out of Grandpa Tom's stories. And the earth mother was angry with me. And the giant, Su Sukalu, breathing fire. He focused on Piper again, his eyes like broken glass, reflecting a crazy kind of light. They said you were a demigod. Your mother was Aphrodite, Piper said. Goddess of love. I, I, he took a shaky breath and then seemed to forget how to exhale. Piper's friends were careful not to watch. Leo fiddled with a lug nut from his tool belt. Jason gazed at the valley below. The roads, backing up as mortals, stopped their cars and gawked at the burning mountain. 
Gleason chewed on the stub of his carnation, and for once the satyr didn't look in the mood to yell or boast. Tristan McLean wasn't supposed to be seen like this. He was a star. He was confident, stylish, suave, always in control. That was the public image he projected. Piper had seen the image falter before, but this was different. Now it was broken, gone. I didn't know about Mum, Piper told him. Not until you were taken. When we found out where you were, we came right away. My friends helped me. No one will hurt you again. Her dad didn't stop shivering. You're heroes. You and your friends. I, I can't believe it. You're a real hero. Not like me. Not playing a part. I'm so proud of you, Pipes. But the words were muttered listlessly in a semi-trance. He gazed down on the valley and his grip on Piper's hand went slack. Your mother never told me. She thought it was for the best. It sounded lame, even to Piper, and no amount of charm speak could change that. But she didn't tell her dad what Aphrodite had really worried about. If he has to spend the rest of his life with those memories, knowing that gods and spirits walk the earth, it will shatter him. Piper felt inside the pocket of her jacket. The vial was still there, warm to her touch. But how could he? she erase his memories? Her dad finally knew who she was. He was proud of her, and for once, she was his hero, not the other way round. He would never send her away now. They shared a secret. How could she go back to the way things were? She held his hand, speaking to him about small things, her time at the wilderness school, her cabin at Camp Halfblood. She told him how Coach Hedge ate carnations and got knocked on his butt on Mount Diablo, how Leo had tamed a dragon, and how Jason had made wolves back down by talking in Latin. Her friend smiled reluctantly as she recounted their adventures. Her dad seemed to relax as she talked, but he didn't smile. Piper wasn't even sure he heard her. As they passed over the hills into the East Bay, Jason tensed. He leaned so far out of the doorway, Piper was afraid he'd fall. He pointed. What is that? Piper looked down, but she didn't see anything interesting. Just hills, woods, houses, little roads snaking through the canyons. A highway cut through a tunnel in the hills, connecting the East Bay with the inland towns. Where? Piper asked. That road, he said. The one that goes through the hills. Piper picked up the comm helmet the pilot had given her and relayed the question over the radio. The answer wasn't very exciting. She says it's Highway 24, Piper reported. That's the Caldecott Tunnel. Why? Jason stared intently at the tunnel entrance, but he said nothing. It disappeared from view as they flew over downtown Oakland. But Jason still stared into the distance, his expression almost as unsettled as Piper's dad. Monsters, her dad said, a tear tracing his cheek. I live in a world of monsters. Chapter 46. Piper. Air traffic control didn't want to let an unscheduled helicopter land at the Oakland airport until Piper got on the radio, and then it turned out to be no problem. They unloaded on the tarmac, and everyone looked at Piper. What now? Jason asked her. She felt uncomfortable. She didn't want to be in charge, but for her dad's sake, she had to appear confident. She had no plan. She just remembered that he'd flown into Oakland, which meant his private plane would still be here. But today was the solstice. They had to save Hera. They had no idea where to go or if they were even too late. And how could she leave her dad in this condition? First thing she said, I, I have to get to my, I have to get my dad home. I'm sorry, guys. Their faces fell. Oh, Leo said. I mean, absolutely. He needs you right now. Uh, we can take it from here. Pipes. No. Her dad had been sitting in the helicopter doorway, a blanket around his shoulders, but he stumbled to his feet. You have a mission. A quest. I, I can't. I'll take care of him, said Coach Hedge. Piper stared at him. The satyr was the last person she'd expected to offer. You, she asked. I'm a protector, Gleason said. That's my job, not fighting. He sounded a little crestfallen, and Piper realised maybe she shouldn't have recounted how he got knocked unconscious in the last battle. In his own way, maybe the satyr was as sensitive as her dad. Then Hedge straightened and set his jaw. Of course, I'm good at fighting too. He glared at them all, daring them to argue. Yes, Jason said. Terrifying, Leo agreed. The coach grunted. But I'm a protector, and I can do this. Your dad's right, Piper. You need to carry on with the quest. But Piper's eyes stung as if she were back in the forest fire. Dad. He held out his arms and she hugged him. He felt frail. He was trembling so much it scared her. Let's give him a minute, Jason said. Let's give them a minute. And they took the pilot a few yards down the tarmac. I can't believe it, her dad said. I failed you. No, Dad. The things they did, Piper, the visions they showed me. Dad, listen. She took out the vial from her pocket. Aphrodite gave me this, for you. It takes away your recent memories. It'll make it like none of this has ever happened. 
He gazed at her, as if translating her words from a foreign language. But you're a hero. I would forget that. Yes, Piper whispered. She forced an assuring tone into her voice. Yes, you would. It'll be like... like before. He closed his eyes and took a shaky breath. I love you, Piper. I always have. I... I sent you away because I didn't want you to... you exposed to my life. Not the way I grew up. The poverty. The hopelessness. Not the Hollywood insanity either. I thought... I thought I was protecting you. He managed a brittle laugh, as if your life without me was better or safer. Piper took his hand. She'd heard him talk about protecting her before, but she'd never believed it. She'd always thought he was just rationalising. Her dad seemed so confident and easygoing, like his life was a joyride. How could he claim she needed protecting from that? Finally, Piper understood he'd been acting for her benefit, trying not to show how scared and insecure he was. He really had been trying to protect her, and now his ability to cope had been destroyed. She offered him the vial. Take it. Maybe someday we'll be ready to talk about this again. When you're ready. When I'm ready, he murmured. You make it sound like... like I'm the one growing up. I'm supposed to be the parent. He took the vial. His eyes glimmered with a small, desperate hope. I love you, Pipes. Love you too, Dad. He drank the pink liquid. His eyes rolled up into his head and he slumped forward. Piper caught him and her friends ran up to help. Got him, Hedge said. The satyr stumbled, but he was strong enough to hold Tristan McLean upright. I already asked our ranger friend to call up his plane. It's on the way now. Home address? Piper was about to tell him, and then a thought occurred to her. She checked her dad's pocket, and his Blackberry was still there. It seemed bizarre that he'd still have something so normal after all he'd been through, but she guessed Enceladus hadn't seen any reason to take it. Everything's on here, Piper said. Address, his chauffeur's number. Just watch out for Jane. Hedge's eyes lit up like he sensed a possible fight. Who's Jane? By the time Piper had explained, her dad's sleek white Gulf Stream had taxied next to the helicopter. Hedge and the flight attendant got Piper's dad on board, and then Hedge came down one last time to say his goodbyes. He gave Piper a hug and glared at Jason and Leo. You cupcakes, take care of this girl, you hear? Or I'm gonna make you pu do push-ups. You got it, coach, Leo said, a smile tugging at his mouth. No push-ups, Jason promised. Piper gave the old satyr one more hug. Thank you, Gleason. Take care of him, please. I've got this, McLean, he assured her. They've got root beer and veggie ench en en enchiladas on the flight and 100% linen napkins. Yum, I could get used to this. Trotting up the stairs, he lost one shoe and his hoof was visible for just a second. The flight attendant's eyes widened, but she looked away and pretended nothing was wrong. Piper figured she'd probably seen stranger things working for Tristan McLean. When the plane was heading down the runway, Piper started to cry. She'd been holding it in too long, and she just couldn't anymore. Before she knew it, Jason was hugging her, and Leo stood uncomfortably nearby, pulling Kleenex out of his tool belt. Your dad's in good hands, Jason said. You were amazing. She sobbed into his shirt. She allowed herself to be held for six deep breaths. Seven. And then she couldn't indulge herself any more. They needed her. The helicopter pilot was already looking uncomfortable, like she was starting to wonder why she'd flown them here. Thank you, guys, Piper said. I... She wanted to tell them how much they meant to her. They'd sacrificed everything, maybe even their quest to help her. She couldn't repay them, couldn't even put her gratitude into words, but her friend's expressions told her they understood. Then, right next to Jason, the air began to shimmer. At first, Piper thought it was the heat off the tarmac, or maybe gas fumes from the helicopter, but she'd seen something like this before in Medea's fountain. It was an iris message. An image appeared in the air, a dark-haired girl in silver winter camouflage holding a bow. Jason stumbled back in surprise. Thalia. Thank the gods, said the hunter. The scene behind her was hard to make out, but Piper heard yelling, metal clashing on metal in explosions. We found her, Thalia said. Where are you? Oakland, he said. Where are you? The wolf house. Oakland is good. You're not too far. We're holding off the giant's minions, but we can't hold them forever. Get here before sunset or it's all over. Then... It's not too late, Piper cried. Hope surged through her, but Thalia's expression quickly dampened it. Not yet, Thalia said. But Jason, it's worse than I realised. Porphyrian is rising. Hurry. But where is the wolf house, he pleaded. Our last trip, Thalia said, her image starting to flicker. The park. Jack London. Remember? This made no sense to Piper, but Jason looked like he'd been shot. He tottered, his face pale, and the iris message disappeared. Bro, you're all right, Leo asked. You know where she is? Yes, Jason said. Sonoma Valley. Not far, not by air. Piper turned to the ranger pilot, who'd been watching all this with an increasingly puzzled expression. 
Ma'am, Piper said with her best smile, you don't mind helping us one more time, do you? I don't mind, the pilot agreed. We can't take a mortal into battle, Jason said. It's too dangerous. He turned to Leo. Do you think you could fly this thing? Um... Leo's expression didn't exactly reassure Piper, but then he put his hand on the side of the helicopter, concentrating hard as if listening to the machine. Bell 412 HP Utility Helicopter, Leo said. Composite four-blade main rotor. Cruising speed, 22 knots. Service ceiling, 20,000 feet. The tank is near full. Sure, I can fly it. Piper smiled at the ranger again. You don't have a problem with an underaged, unlicensed kid borrowing your copter, do you? We'll return it. I, uh... The pilot nearly choked on the words, but she got them out. I don't have a problem with that. Leo grinned. Hop in, kids. Uncle Leo's going to take you for a ride. Chapter 47. Leo. Fly a helicopter. Sure, why not? Leo had done plenty of crazier things that week. The sun was going down as they flew north from the Richmond Bridge, and Leo couldn't believe the day had gone so quickly. Once again, nothing like ADHD and a good fight to the death to make time fly. Piloting the chopper, he went back and forth between confidence and panic. If he didn't think about it, he found himself automatically flipping the right switches, checking the altimeter, easing back on the stick and flying straight. If he allowed himself to consider what he was doing, he started freaking out. He imagined his Aunt Rosa yelling at him in Spanish, telling him he was a delinquent lunatic who was going to crash and burn. Part of him suspected she was right. Going okay? Piper asked from the co-pilot's seat. She sounded more nervous than he was, so Leo put on a brave face. Aces, he said. Uh, so what's the wolf house? Jason knelt between their seats. An abandoned mansion in the Sonoma Valley. A demigod built it. Jack London. Leo couldn't place the name. He's an actor? Writer, Piper said. Adventure stuff, right? Call of the Wild? White Fang? Yeah, Jason said. He was a son of Mercury. I mean, Hermes. He was an adventurer. Travelled the world. He was even a hobo for a while, and then he made a fortune writing. He bought a big ranch in the country and decided to build this huge mansion. The Wolf House. Named that because he wrote about wolves, Leo guessed? Partially, Jason said, but the site and the reason he wrote about wolves, he was dropping hints about his personal experience. There are a lot of holes in his life story, how he was born, who his dad was, why he wandered around so much, stuff you can only explain if you know he was a demigod. The bay slipped behind them and the helicopter continued north. Ahead of them, yellow hills rolled out as far as Leo could see. So Jack London went to Camp Halfblood. Leo guessed. No, Jason said. No, he didn't. Bro, you're freaking me out with this mysterious talk. Are you remembering your past or not? Pieces, Jason said. Only pieces. None of it good. The wolf house is on sacred ground. It's where London started his journey as a child, where he found out he was a demigod. That's why he returned there. He thought he could live there, claim that land, but it wasn't meant for him. The wolf house was cursed. It burned in a fire a week before he and his wife were supposed to move in. A few years later, London died and his ashes were buried on the site. So, Piper said, how do you know all this? A shadow crossed Jason's face, probably just a cloud, but Leo could swear the shape looked like an eagle. I started my journey there too, Jason said. It's a powerful place for demigods, a dangerous place. If Gaia can claim it, use its power to entomb Hera on the solstice and raise Porphyrian, that might be enough to awaken the earth goddess fully. Leo kept his hand on the joystick, guiding the chopper at full speed, racing towards the north. He could see some weather ahead, a spot of darkness like a cloud bank or a storm, right where they were going. Piper's dad had called him a hero earlier, and uh, Leo couldn't believe some of the things he'd done. Smacking around cyclopses, disarming exploding doorbells, battling six-armed ogres with construction equipment. They seemed like they'd happened to another person. He was just Leo Valdez, an orphan kid from Houston. He'd spent his life running away, and part of him still wanted to run. What was he thinking, flying towards a cursed mansion to fight more evil monsters? His mum's voice echoed in his head. Nothing is unfixable. Except the fact that you're gone forever, Leo thought. Seeing Piper and her dad back together had fight really driven that home. Even if Leo survived this quest and saved Hera, Leo wouldn't have any happy reunions. He wouldn't be going back to a loving family. He wouldn't see his mum. The helicopter shuddered. Metal creaked and Leo could almost imagine the tapping was Morse code. Not the end. Not the end. He levelled out the chopper and the creaking stopped. He was just hearing things. He couldn't dwell on his mum or the idea that kept bugging him. The guy was bringing souls back from the underworld. So why couldn't he make some good, good come out of it? Thinking like that would drive him crazy. He had a job to do. 
He let his instincts take over, just like flying the helicopter. If he thought about the quest too much or what might happen afterwards, he'd panic. The trick was not to think, just get through it. 30 minutes out, he told his friends, though he wasn't sure how he knew. If you want to get some rest, now's a good time. Jason strapped himself into the back of the helicopter and passed out almost immediately. Piper and Leo stayed wide awake. After a few minutes of awkward silence, Leo said, Your dad'll be fine, you know. Nobody's going to mess with him with that crazy goat around. Piper glanced over and Leo was stuck by how much she changed. She changed, not just physically. Her presence was stronger. She seemed more here. At wilderness school, she'd spent the semester trying not to be seen, hiding out in the back row of the classroom, the back of the bus, the corner of the lunchroom, as far as possible from the loud kids. Now she would be impossible to miss. It didn't matter what she was wearing. You'd have to look at her. My dad, she said thoughtfully. Yeah, I know. I was thinking about Jason. I'm worried about him. Leo nodded. The closer they got to that bank of dark clouds, the more Leo worried too. He's starting to remember her. That's got to make him a little edgy. But what if... What if he's a different person? Leo had the same thought. If the mist could affect their memories, could Jason's whole personality be an illusion too? If their friend wasn't their friend, and they were heading into a cursed mansion, a dangerous place for demigods, what would happen if Jason's full memory came back in the middle of a battle? Now, nah, Leo decided... After all we've been through, I can't see it. We're a team. Jason can handle it. Piper smoothed her blue dress, which was tattered and burnt from their fight on Mount Diablo. I hope you're right. I need him. She cleared her throat. I mean, I need to trust him. I know, Leo said, after seeing her dad break down. Leo understood Piper couldn't afford to lose Jason as well. She just watched Tristan McLean, her cool, suave movie star dad, reduced to near insanity. Leo could barely stand to watch that. But for Piper, wow, Leo couldn't even imagine. He'd figured that would make her insecure about herself too. If weakness was inherited, she'd be wondering, could she break down the same way her dad did? Hey, don't worry, Leo said. Piper, you're the strongest, most powerful beauty queen I've ever met. You can trust yourself. For what it's worth, you can trust me too. The helicopter dipped in a wind shear and Leo almost jumped out of his skin. He cursed and righted the chopper. Piper laughed nervously. Trust you, huh? Ah, shut up already. But he grinned at her and, for a second, it felt like he was just relaxing comfortably with a friend. And then they hit the storm clouds. Chapter 48. Leo. At first, Leo thought rocks were pelting the windshield. Then he realised it was sleet. Frost built up around the edges of the glass and slushy waves of ice blotted out his view. An ice storm? Piper shouted over the engine and the wind. Is it supposed to be this cold in Sonoma? Leo wasn't sure, but something about this storm seemed conscious, malevolent, like it was intentionally slamming them. Jason woke up quickly. He crawled forward, grabbing their seats for balance. We've got to be getting close. Leo was too busy wrestling with the stick to reply. Suddenly, it wasn't so easy to drive the chopper. Its movements turned sluggish and jerky. The whole machine shuddered in the icy wind. The helicopter probably hadn't been prepped for cold weather flying. The controls refused to respond and they started to lose altitude. Below them, the ground was a dark quilt of trees and fog. The ridge of a hill loomed in front of them, and Leo yanked the stick, just clearing the treetops. There, Jason shouted. A small valley opened up before them, with the murky shape of a building in the middle. Leo aimed the helicopter straight for it. All around them were flashes of light that reminded Leo of the tracer fire at Midas's compound. Trees cracked and exploded at the edges of the clearing. Shapes moved through the mist. Combat seemed to be everywhere. He set down the helicopter in an icy field about 50 yards from the house and killed the engine. He was about to relax when he heard a whistling sound and saw a dark shape hurtling towards them out of the mist. Out! Leo screamed. They leapt from the helicopter and barely cleared the rotors before a massive boom shook the ground, knocking Leo off his feet and splattering ice all over him. He got up shakily and saw that the world's largest snowball, a chunk of snow, ice and dirt the size of a garage, had completely flattened the Bell 412. You all right? Jason ran up to him, Piper at his side. They both looked fine except for being speckled with snow and mud. Yeah, Leo shivered. Guess we owe that ranger lady a new helicopter. Piper pointed south. Fighting's over there. Then she frowned. No, it's all around us. She was right. The sounds of combat rang across the valley. The snow and mist made it hard to tell for sure, but there seemed to be a circle of fighting all around the wolf house. Behind them loomed Jack London's dream home, a massive ruin of red and grey stones and rough-hewn timber beams. Leo could imagine how it had looked before it burned down, 
a combination log cabin and castle like a billionaire lumberjack might build. But in the mist and sleet, the place had a lonely, haunted feel. Leo could totally believe the ruins were cursed. Jason, a girl's voice called. Thalia appeared from the fog, her parka caked with snow. Her bow was in her hand and her quiver was almost empty. She ran towards them, but made it only a few steps before a six-armed ogre, one of the earthborn, burst out of the storm behind her, a raised club in each hand. Look out! Leo yelled. They rushed to help, but Thalia had it under control. She launched herself into a flip, notching an arrow as she pivoted like a gymnast and landed in a kneeling position. The ogre got a silver arrow right between the eyes and melted into a pile of clay. Thalia stood and retrieved her arrow, but the point had snapped off. That was my last one. She kicked the pile of clay resentfully. Stupid ogre. Nice shot, though, Leo said. Thalia ignored him as usual, which no, no doubt meant she thought he was as cool as ever. She hugged Jason and nodded to Piper. Just in time. My hunters are holding a perimeter around the mansion, but we'll be overrun by minute, in any minute. By Earthborn, Jason asked. And wolves. Lysons. Minions. Thalia blew a fleck of ice off her nose. Also storm spirits. But we gave them to Aeolus, Piper protested. Who tried to kill us, Leah reminded her. Maybe he's helping Gaia again. I don't know, Thalia said. But the monsters keep reforming almost as fast as we can kill them. We took the wolf house with no problem, surprised the guards and sent them straight to Tartarus. But then this freak snowstorm blew in. Wave after wave of monsters started attacking. Now we're surrounded. I don't know who or what is leading the assault, but I think they planned this. It was a trap to kill anyone who tried to rescue Hera. Where is she? Jason asked. Inside, Thalia said. We tried to free her, but we can't figure out how to break the cage. It's only a few minutes until the sun goes down. Hera thinks that's the moment when Porfarian will be reborn. Plus, most monsters are stronger at night. If we don't free Hera soon. She didn't need to finish the fort. Leo, Jason and Piper followed her into the ruined mansion. Jason stepped over the threshold and immediately collapsed. Hey, Leo caught him. None of that, man. What's wrong? This place. Jason shook his head. Sorry, it came rushing back to me. So you have been here, Piper said. We both have, Thalia said. Her expression was grim, like she was reliving someone's death. This is where my mum took us when Jason was a child. She left him here, told me he was dead. He just disappeared. She gave me to the wolves, Jason murmured, at Hera's insistence. She gave me to Looper. That part I didn't know, Thalia frowned. Who is Looper? An explosion shook the building. Just outside, a blue mushroom cloud billowed up, raining snowflakes and ice like a nuclear blast made of cold instead of heat. Maybe this isn't the time for questions, Leo suggested. Show us the goddess. Once inside, Jason seemed to get his bearings. The house was built in a giant U, and Jason led them between the two wings to an outside courtyard with an empty reflecting pool. At the bottom of the pool, just as Jason had described from his dream, two spires of rock and root tendrils had cracked through the foundation. One of the spires was much bigger, a solid dark mass about 20 feet high, and to Leo it looked like a stone body bag. Underneath the mass of fused tendrils, he could make out the shape of a head, wide shoulders, a massive chest and arms, like the creature was stuck waist deep in the earth. No, not stuck, rising. On the opposite end of the pool, the other spire was smaller and more loosely woven. Each tendril was as thick as a telephone pole, with no so little space between them that Leo doubted he could have got his arm through. Still, he could see inside, and in the centre of the cage stood Tia Kalida. She looked exactly like Leo remembered, dark hair covered with a shawl, the black dress of a widow, a wrinkled face with glinting, scary eyes. She didn't glow or radiate any sort of power. She looked like a regular mortal woman his goal, good old psychotic babysitter. Leo dropped into the pool and approached the cage. Hola, Tia. Little bit of trouble? She crossed her arms and sighed in exasperation. Don't ins inspect me like I'm one of your machines, Leo Valdez. Get me out of here. Thalia stepped next to him and looked at the cage with distaste. Or maybe she was looking at the goddess. We tried everything we could think of, Leo, but maybe my heart wasn't in it. If it was up to me, I'd just leave her in there. Oh, Thalia Grace the goddess said. When I get out of here, you'll be sorry you were ever born. Save it, Thalia snapped. You've been nothing but a curse to every child of Zeus for ages. You sent a bunch of in intestinally challenged cows after my friend Annabeth. She was disrespectful. You dropped a statue on my legs. It was an accident. And you took my brother. Thalia's voice cracked with emotion. 
Here, on this spot, you ruined our lives. We should leave you to Gaia. Hey, Jason intervened. Valia, a sis. I know, but this isn't the time. You should help your hunters. Valia clenched her jaw. Fine, for you, Jason. But if you ask me, she isn't worth it. Valia turned, leapt out of the pool and stormed from the building. Leo turned to Hera with grudging respect. Intestinally challenged cows? Focus on the cage, Leo, she grumbled. And Jason, you are wiser than your sister. I chose my champion well. I'm not your champion, lady, Jason said. I'm only helping you because you stole my memories and you're better than the alternative. Speaking of which, what's going on with that? He nodded to the other spire that looked like the king-sized granite body bag. Was Leo imagining it or had it grown taller since they got here? That, Jason, Hera said, is the king of the giants being reborn. Gross, Piper said. Indeed, Hera said. Porphyrian, the strongest of his kind. Gaia needed a great deal of power to raise him again. My power. For weeks I've grown weaker as my essence was used to grow him a new form. So you're like a heat lamp, Leo guessed, or fertilizer. The goddess glared at him, but Leo didn't care. This old lady had been making his life miserable since he was a baby. He totally had rights to rag on her. Joke all you wish, Hera said in a clipped tone. But at sundown it will be too late. The giant will awake. He will offer me a choice. Marry him or be consumed by the earth. And I cannot marry him. We will all be destroyed. And as we die, Gaia will awaken. Leo frowned at the giant's spire. Can't we blow it up or something? Without me, you do not have the power, Hera said. You might as well try to destroy a mountain. Done that once today, Jason said. Just hurry up and let me out, Hera demanded. Jason scratched his head. Leo, can you do it? I don't know. Leo tried not to panic. Besides, if she's a goddess, why hasn't she busted herself out? Hera paced furiously around her cage, cursing in ancient Greek. Use your brain, Leo Valdez. I picked you because you're intelligent. Once trapped, a god's power is useless. Your own father trapped me once in a golden chair. It was humiliating. I had to beg, beg him for my freedom and apologize for throwing him off Olympus. Sounds fair, Leo said. Hera gave him the godly stink eye. I've watched you since you were a child, son of Hephaestus, because I knew you could aid me at this moment. If anyone can find a way to destroy this abomination, it is you. But it's not a machine. It's like Gaia thrust her hand out of the ground and... Leo felt dizzy. The line of their prophecy came back to him. The forge and dove shall break the cage. Hold on. I do have an idea. Piper, I'm going to need your help. And we're going to need time. The air turned brittle with cold. The temperature dropped so fast, Leo's lips cracked and his breath changed to mist. Frost coated the walls of the wolf house. Venti rushed in, but instead of winged men, these were like shaped like horses with dark storm cloud bodies and manes that crackled with lightning. Some had silver arrows sticking out of their flanks. Behind them came red-eyed wolves and the six-armed earthborn. Piper drew her dagger. Jason grabbed an ice-covered plank off the, the pool floor. Leo reached into his tool belt. But he was so shaken up, all he produced was a tin of breath mints. He shoved them back in, hoping nobody had noticed, and drew a hammer instead. One of the wolves padded forward. It was dragging a human-sized statue by the leg. At the edge of the pool, the wolf opened its maw and dropped the statue for them to, to, to see. An ice sculpture of a girl. An archer with short spiky hair and a surprised look on her face. Valia! Jason rushed forward, but Piper and Leo pulled him back. The ground around Thalia's statue was already webbed with ice. Leo feared if Jason touched her, he might freeze too. Who did this? Jason yelled. His body crackled with electricity. I'll kill you myself. From somewhere behind the monsters, Leo heard a girl's laughter, clear and cold. She stepped out of the mist in her snowy white dress, a silver crown atop her long black hair. She regarded them with those deep brown eyes Leo had thought were so beautiful in Quebec. Bonsoir. Mes amis, said Kione, the goddess of snow. She gave Leo a frosty smile. Alas, son of Hephaestus, you say you need time. I'm afraid time is one tool you do not have. Chapter 49. Jason. After the fight on Mount Diablo, Jason didn't think he could ever feel more afraid or devastated. Now his sister was frozen at his feet. He was surrounded by monsters. He'd broken his golden sword and replaced it with a piece of wood. He had approximately five minutes until the King of the Giants busted out and destroyed them. Jason had already pulled his biggest ace, calling down Zeus's lightning when he fought Enceladus. 
and he doubted he'd have the strength or the cooperation from above to do it again, which meant his only assets were one whiny imprisoned goddess, one sort-of girlfriend with a dagger, and Leo, who apparently thought he could defeat the armies of darkness with breath mints. On top of all this, Jason's worst memories were flooding back. He knew for certain he'd done many dangerous things in his life, but he'd never been closer to death than he was right now. The enemy was beautiful. Keone smiled, her dark eyes glittering as a dagger of ice grew in her hand. What have you done? Jason demanded. Oh, so many things, the snow goddess purred. Your sister's not dead, if that's what you mean. She and her hunters will make fine toys for our wolves. I thought we'd defrost them one at a time and hunt them down for amusement. Let them be the prey for once. The wolves snarled appreciatively. Yes, my dears, Keone kept her eyes on Jason. Your sister almost killed their king, you know. Lysion's off in a cave somewhere, no doubt licking his wounds. But his minions have joined us to take revenge for their master. And so soon Porphyrian will arise, and we shall rule the world. Traitor, Hero shouted. You meddlesome D-list goddess, you aren't worthy to pour my wine, much less rule the world. Keone sighed. Tiresome as ever, Queen Hera. I've been wanting to shut you up for millennia. Keone waved her hand, and ice encased the prison, sealing in the spaces between the earthen tendrils. That's better, the snow goddess said. Now, demigods, about your death. You're the one who tricked Hera into coming here, Jason said. You gave Zeus the idea of closing Olympus. The wolves snarled, and the storm spirits whinnied, ready to attack, but Keone held up her hand. Patience, my loves. If he wants to talk, what matter? The sun is setting and time is on our side. Of course, Jason Grace. Like now, my voice is quiet and gentle and very cold. It's easy for me to whisper to the other gods, especially when I am only confirming their own deepest fears. I also whispered in Aeolus's ear that he should issue an order to kill demigods. It is a small service for Gaia, but I am sure I will be well rewarded when her sons, the giants, come to power. You could have killed us in Quebec, Jason said. Why let us live? Keone wrinkled her nose. Messy business, killing you in my father's house, especially when he insists on meeting all visitors. I did try, you remember? It would have been lovely if he'd agreed to turn you to ice, but once he'd given you guarantee of safe passage, I couldn't openly disobey him. My father is an old fool. He lives in fear of Zeus and Aeolus, but he's still powerful. Soon enough, when my new masters have awakened, I will depose Boreas and take the throne of the North Wind, but not just yet. Besides, my father did have a point. Your quest was suicidal. I fully expected you to fail. And to help us with that, Leo said. You knocked our dragon out of the sky over Detroit. Those frozen wires in his head. That was your fault. You're going to pay for that. You're also the one who kept Enceladus informed about us, Piper added. We've been plagued by snowstorms the whole trip. Yes, I feel so close to all of you now, Keone said. Once you made it past Omaha, I decided to ask Lysion to track you down so Jason could die here, at the wolf house. Keone smiled at him. You see, Jason, your blood spilled on this sacred ground will taint it for generations. Your demigod brethren will be outraged, especially when they find the bodies of these two from Camp Half-Blood. They'll believe the Greeks have conspired with giants. It will be delicious. Piper and Leo didn't seem to understand what she was saying, but Jason knew. His memories were returning enough for him to realise how dangerously effective Keone's plan could be. You'll set demigods against demigods, he said. It's so easy, said Keone. As I told you, I only encourage what you would do anyway. But why? Piper spread her hands. Keone, you'll tear the world apart. The giants will destroy everything. You don't want that. Call off your monsters. Keone hesitated and then laughed. Your persuasive powers are improving, girl, but I am a goddess. You can't charm speak me. We wind gods are creatures of chaos. I'll overthrow Aeolus and let the storms run free. If we destroy the mortal world, all the better. They never honoured me, even in Greek times. Humans and their talk of global warming, pah, I'll cool them down quickly enough. When we retake the ancient places, I will cover the Acropolis in snow. The ancient places? Leo's eyes widened. That's what Enceladus meant about destroying the roots of the gods. He meant Greece. You could join me, son of Hephaestus. Keone said, I know you find me beautiful. It would be enough for my plan if these other two were to die. Reject that ridiculous destiny the fates have given you. Live and be my champion instead. Your skills will be quite useful. Leo looked stunned. He glanced behind him, like Keone might be talking to somebody else. For a second, Jason was worried. He figured Leo didn't have beautiful goddesses make him offers like this every day. 
And then Leo laughed so hard, he doubled over. Yeah, join you, right, until you get bored of me and turn me into a, a Leosicle. Lady, nobody messes with my dragon and gets away with it. I can't believe I thought you were hot. Keone's face turned red. Hot? You dare insult me? I am cold, Leo Valdez. Very, very cold. She shot a blast of wintry sleet at the demigods, but Leo held up his hand. A wall of fire roared to life in front of them, and the snow dissolved in a steamy cloud. Leo grinned. Sea lady, that's what happens to snow in Texas. It freaking melts. Keone hissed. Enough of this. Hera is failing. Porphyrian is rising. Kill the demigods. Let them be our king's first meal. Jason hefted his icy wooden plank, a stupid weapon to die fighting with, and the monsters charged.